We receive the promises of God and we need to know that our faith, our trust in these promises will be tested. I will yet praise Him, my great redeemer. truth. Hey church, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 16. We're going to be looking there in a moment. If there's anything we've learned in the last number of months is that waiting isn't easy. It tests our patience. And that's often true in our Christian lives as well. It can be in the, the same in our walk with God. We, we hear the promises of God, but When they take time to manifest in our experience of him, it challenges our faith. We begin to become impatient. We sometimes lose our resolve and we want to take things into our own hands instead of waiting on his power. And Genesis chapter 16 is a chapter just about that. God has given Abram some glorious promises and even confirmed them by covenant. In Genesis chapter 15, God said to Abram, a child from your very own body is going to be born to you. That was the first time that God had revealed to Abram that this promised son would come from his own flesh. And he's at another high point in his walk with God, But by now, if you've studied the story of Abram carefully, you begin to realize a pattern that unfolds. Every time God blesses Abram and gives him a promise, his faith is tested right afterwards. Every time God reaffirms his commitment and his promise to Abram, his faith is tested. And Genesis 16 is no different. Abram has just come off a high point in his walk with God. God has reaffirmed his commitment to him and even bound himself to him by covenant. And today we're going to look at how their faith is tested. And we're going to look at the plan of Sarah, the pain that comes about because of it, and the promise of God. Genesis 16 verse 1 says this, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Now, again, we read these verses in light of preceding events. As mentioned, God has just reaffirmed his commitment to Abram and said to him, it's going to come from your own body. But I always wonder to myself, how did those promises land with Sarah? We are repeatedly told throughout the story of Abram that Sarah is barren. And we know this has been going on for years now, even before they got into the land of Canaan. It's been at least 10 years, probably decades, that Abram has been walking with these promises. And every time that he shares this with Sarah, I wonder, is it like acid in her veins? Maybe she keeps hearing about these great and glorious promises, but she's had enough about these wonderful promises because every time she hears about it, they never seemingly come to pass, and they've even left their homeland, they've left their family of origin, their own country, to follow God's promises. And every time her husband comes home excited, she's reminded of her inability, of her greatest source of pain and shame. And Sarah opens chapter 16 with some powerful words. She says, the Lord has kept me from having children. You know, when Abram comes home, she doesn't say to him, wow, that's awesome. The child's going to come from your own body. I wonder how that's going to happen. I wonder how El Shaddai, the God over everything, is going to bring this to pass. There's no worship. There's no seeking God. 
Sarah's first statement is, the Lord has kept me from having children. It's God's fault that I'm not having children. He's withholding this from me. And so where does Sarah turn with her disappointment? What's her plan to get on with these promises? She turns to Egypt. And if you're familiar with the story of Abram, you're probably thinking to yourself, no, don't do it. You guys did this. In Genesis chapter 12, when there was a famine in the land, you turned to Egypt for your resources. And here you are in chapter 16. Again, there's a different famine in the land. It's a a barrenness of children. And Sarah turns to Egypt for their solution. It's another loop of disobedience where we are captivated by the promises of God. But when they're slow to come to pass, we start to take things into our own hands. We start to rely on our own strength and You see that in their first loop of disobedience in Genesis chapter 12, something followed them back from Egypt that we're introduced to here in Genesis 16. Hagar is a slave that they picked up in Egypt and that is reintroduced into the story. And when faced with her own inability, Sarah turns to conventional wisdom. She says to her husband, here, take my slave and maybe I can have a family through her. Now, you have to understand it was culturally appropriate in Old Testament times. This was a normal practice. If a wife couldn't have children, one of her slaves would have children on her behalf, but they would be reckoned as hers. And Sarah has just assumed that this cultural practice is God's plan. They didn't ask him. They didn't inquire or worship El Shaddai to see if this was the next step in fulfilling this promise. But in Sarah's pain and her shame, she turns to what she can do. She turns to what's in her own power, not El Shaddai's power. And there's just a couple things that I want to touch on when we look at this text. First, it's this. There are always lingering consequences from our loops of disobedience. When you sow disobedience, it always, always, always reaps some consequences. Traps and snares are set when we wander and live by our own strength. It never ends well. Whether it's a seared conscience as we increasingly embrace sinful behavior and choices that take us away from God, we saw that in the life of Lot, Abraham's nephew, or it's gross disobedience that results in dramatic results, all forms of mistrust, all forms of a lack of faith and living by our own flesh has devastating consequences. The plan with Hagar is evidence of that. This wouldn't have even been possible had they not taken that loop of disobedience into Egypt. But now the lingering effects of that loop of disobedience are coming back into the story. Secondly, what we learn from this text is that waiting, although it's not easy, is essential. We receive the promises of God and we need to know that our faith, our trust in these promises will be tested. But the question we must wrestle with is, will we trust God when the promises aren't materializing as fast as we want them to? Or will we take things into our own hands? Maybe God has promised you something as you're watching this today and it's taking a long time to come about. Some of us have a hard time waiting 10 minutes, 10 months, let alone 10 years like Abram and Sarah. But what this text reminds us of is to beware of reaching out for something that God hasn't yet permitted or handed to you. Beware of grasping at it or taking matters into your own hands. Abram and Sarah are facing another test of their faith. And sadly, they've hatched a plan that has nothing to do with seeking El Shaddai, but rather seeking to make something happen. We read in verse 4, When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. That's Hagar towards Sarah. In verse 5, Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. 
Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. You know, it's funny to me that when you've set your heart on a course of action that's outside of God's plan, it seems like the very thing that you wanted the most becomes the very thing that you despise the most once you've finally received it. Our lust, even for maybe good things, when pursued outside of God's plan, result in pain. Sarah's plan came to pass, but it's actually resulted in more pain and shame for her. You see, it's disrupted the family order. Her servant has actually uh, started to move into a position that is more favored than her. It's, It's complicated the whole marriage between Abram and Sarah. And Hagar actually begins to despise Sarah. And then Sarah blames Abram. It's interesting the loop of disobedience that Sarah's on. She blames God for her barrenness. She blames her husband for her misery and fails to see how her own planning brought this about. It seems like she's upset with everybody. She's upset with God. She's upset with her husband. She's upset with Hagar. You know, it reminds us that when we refuse to wait on God's timing, we give birth to all kinds of pain and anger. This is Genesis 3 all over again, but Abram's no better. His solution to the whole situation is simply to avoid responsibility and pass the buck. Do whatever you want with her. It it sounds a lot like Adam in the garden when, when God comes and confronts them with what they've done. You can see blame shifting in those situations and Abram has the same tendency here. And in her anger, we're told that Sarah mistreated Hagar. Now the word in Hebrew used for mistreated in chapter 16 is actually the exact same Hebrew word that's used in chapter 15 to describe the oppression and mistreatment and slavery of Israel in Egypt. And so we can draw from that word usage that it was pretty severe how Sarah mistreated Hagar. It was so severe that she fled for her life. You know, I wonder how Hagar is feeling at this point in the story. She's a slave girl with no rights. She has just been used as a pawn and a plan. She had no real choice in the whole situation. And she has been mistreated, and now she's on the run back to her land of origin. She's on the run back to Egypt. Just like in Genesis chapter 12, when God had to come to the aid of Sarah when she was in the arms of Pharaoh, God sees all this happening and steps into the story to clean up the mess made by this loop of disobedience. We read in verse 7, The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. You gotta understand how earth shatteringly unique this is. In the Old Testament, slaves had no rights, no influence, no power, no position. They were, for all intents and purposes, invisible. Nobody would focus on them, let alone a God. But El Shaddai isn't like the cultural gods of the Old Testament. He sees the mistreatment of Hagar and he steps into the story. He begins to redeem Sarah's broken plan. God steps in and makes Hagar a part of his plan. It's like he's saying to her, I have an assignment for you, a purpose for you to serve in this story. Because look at what he says in verse 9. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. 
and he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. You know, it's interesting to observe that God gives her a command and a blessing. His command is, go back to your mistress and submit. Go back under that yoke of mistreatment or oppression. But he also includes a blessing. I will increase your descendants. The blessing of Abram has now been promised to Hagar. And he forecasts and says to her, you're going to give birth to a son. And God even names her son, Ishmael. God will hear or God hears. And he, and he prophesies what's going to happen. He will not live a conventional life. He will live free. He will live nomadic. He will be wild at heart. He will be at odds with others. But Hagar is overwhelmed with this interaction that she's just had with El Shaddai. And we read in verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. You have to understand, this is such a powerful truth and moment, not only for Hagar, but for all of humanity. In a world that would never even notice her, that would simply overlook her because she is nothing. She is simply a slave girl. God chooses to reveal himself to a slave and permits her to be the first one to ascribe a name to him. Hagar is the first one in all of scripture to name God. You are El Ra'i, the God who sees me. Now that Hebrew word for see means so much more than just looking at someone and seeing that they're there. It means to look at intently, to gaze upon, to notice, to have regard for, take concern for, consider, give attention to, value. He is the God of the invisible. He is the God who sees the downtrodden. He is the God who hears the cries of the forgotten. He is the God who redeems the broken. He is the God who steps into the pain of his people. He is the God who sees everyone. This God steps into Hagar's life and lets her know, I see you, I value you. Hagar encounters the God who sees and takes notice, and she sent to Abram and Sarah a different person. No longer has she simply heard of the God of Abram. She has now experienced him for herself, and she is forever changed by the encounter. And just as Pharaoh was used in Genesis chapter 12 to rebu rebuke Abram and Sarah, so Hagar is used in chapter 16 to reveal who God is. Hagar is actually the obedient one. God doesn't waste anything. God uses the very instrument they depended upon to speak the truth of who he is back to them. Hagar is sent back to Abram and Sarah and is obedient to God's command to go and bear up under that oppression. And she brings back the name of the son she carries. God has appeared to me, and he has told me that you shall name him Ishmael. God hears. God has heard your misery. The name that they are going to give this child would forever be a reminder to Sarah and Abram that this God is unlike any other God that they've encountered. He is the God who has seen their misery. Sarah, you should have known that and you should have come to me in your misery and your distress and laid it before me because I am El Ra'i. I am the God who sees the famine and the barrenness that you're hurt by. This is such a powerful moment for the whole family that Abram names this son, Ishmael, we read in verse 15, so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave him the name Ishmael. 
to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. You know, we learn some painful lessons through our loops of disobedience. When we stray away from trusting God to bring about his promises in miraculous ways and and take matters into our own hands, no good comes of it. But what we can be encouraged by is that even in the midst of their loops of disobedience, God continues to step in and redeem the situation. And Hagar is forever changed by her encounter with the God who sees her. And let me close with this thought. Maybe you've been waiting on God for something for a long, long time. It was 10 years into Abram and Sarah's story. Maybe he's made some promises to you and they're slow to come to pass and you've been waiting a long time and maybe you're just barely holding on. Can I encourage you today? Continue to wait on God to bring it about to pass in his timing, not your timing. Worship him as you wait. Cry out to El Shaddai, the God over everything, El Ra'i, the God who sees your distress. Beware of grasping for something. Let it come to pass in his timing. And go to him with your pain, your distress or your shame or your misery because he cares for you. In Romans chapter three, we read that there is no one righteous. I read the story of Abram and Sarah and I say, amen. But let's get honest. Are we any different? Maybe you're listening to this today and you relate to Abram and Sarah. Maybe you've reached out to grasp something and it's blown up in your face and you've made a royal mess of your life. And you're living with the painful reminder, the consequences of your poor choices. But here's the good news. You are messed up. You can't save yourself. You can't bring about the promise of God by your best efforts. He is the God who sees you. He is the God who takes notice of you, is concerned about you, gives attention to you, and comes to the aid of you. When we turn to the New Testament, Jesus is the God who sees us incarnated amongst us. That's why he healed the leper. That's why he went to the outcast, to the invisible. He came to rescue what was broken inside all of us. And if you ever have doubts about his concern for you, Just look to the cross. The God who sees every person that has ever lived, is living, ever will live, is the same God who hung from the cross and declared, Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. The same God who cried from the cross, it is finished. So if you're listening to this today and you don't know this God, but you want to know him, I invite you to pray with me now and welcome him to reveal himself to you. I don't know exactly how he will go about that, but I know without a shadow of a doubt that he is the God who sees you. And just as he revealed himself to Hagar, he's able to reveal himself to you. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that even in our loops of disobedience, in your mercy and your grace, you speak back to us. And Lord, for anyone who's watching, who is in that place of waiting and struggling, I pray that you would meet them now, comfort them, and hold them close. And Lord, for anyone who's watching today and doesn't know you, but longs to know the God who sees them, I pray that now by your Holy Spirit, you would open the mind of their understanding to see that Jesus is the God they've been seeking all their life. And Lord, that they would reach out and invite you to be Lord of their lives. We thank you that you meet us in our distress, but that you don't leave us there. 
And so I pray today that you would make yourself known to those who are sincerely seeking you. And we thank you that because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can stand before you righteous and without blemish, not because of who we are, but because of the God who saw us, came, and died on the cross for our sins. We love you and thank you for this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Join us next week for the continuation of this series. This is Living Truth.